Hello, Tim. Hi, Lily. Hi, good to have you in Berlin. Good to be here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so um, very happy to have you here. We're chatting about your book. I've got it here in German. Das this Update. Das Update. I know you can read it in German yeah. as well. Yeah, it has, you understand has it? another title as well, of course. Still, Wohlstand ohne Wachstum. Wohlstand ohne Wachstum, das Update. Genau. Um, but we're having our chat in English, um, although the book that you will present here mm. in Berlin with us mm. is in German. Um, and um, so you're not here for the first time, and this is not the first book with the title Wohlstand ohne Wachstum, Prosperity Without Growth. This is the second edition, or in German it's Das Update, the update. Das Update, exactly. So you first, you know, you first started <coughs> sort of publishing about this in 2009, 2010. Yeah. So what's new in this book? What has happened that made you write this second edition? I, yeah, I mean, the first edition in a way was, was a total surprise because it was written as a government report and then it, it, it just received this sort of um, audience all over the world mm. that was totally unexpected and that I didn't really write the book for. So the second time round, I thought I would write it for all the people who actually, in the end, ended up wanting to hear about it and really have a debate about growth. And, and it was also, I think, that, that so much had changed um, following the financial crisis. We understood more about what had gone wrong in the financial system. We understood more about what needed to be fixed. And one of the most interesting things of all, in a way, was that we understood that the economy, in its own terms, is not going to go on growing the way mm. that we thought it would and hoped it would, mm -hmm. and that conventional economists say it should. It's actually already beginning to move into a different state. And that was a real, that's a real opportunity for the kind of work that, that I was doing, because it, it, it sort of puts it more in the mainstream. And mm -hmm. I wanted to use that opportunity, really, to tease out um, very specifically how the economy should be different, which bits of it should be different, how we should think about enterprise and investment and work and money in a different kind of way and, and really begin to lay down the building blocks, the, the foundations for the economy of tomorrow. Yeah, that is actually the subtitle of your book, it is, is indeed, the yeah, yeah. Foundations for um, the Economy of Tomorrow. I have many questions about that, but you also welcome and invited um, to, to send your questions that I can then raise and ask Tim here. So please send us your questions. We already have one question that I will later bring into the interview here. But so when you discuss this fo these foundations for the economy mm. of tomorrow, you talk about um, that we need, you say that we need a convincing macroeconomics for post-growth yes. society and economics. Yeah. So what what exactly does does that mean so w what the is what yeah. is that foundation it, it kind of means i mean you you think take these foundations my four foundations enterprise work investment money that's great we can think about better ways to do that but we still have to put it together into an understanding of how the economy actually works and the reality is we've got a we've got a science of economics we've got a macro economics that really is 60, 70, almost 80 years old. It comes mm -hmm. from Keynes and the Great Depression and the, 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 the trauma that, that economics and society underwent when there was a huge recession. And so our mac macroeconomics really has, has its starting point, the idea that we need growth, growth, growth. Mm -hmm. That's what will save us. That's what will give us stability. That's what will allow us to have a financial system. That's what will make everything better. And we don't have the science of an economics that says, actually, guys, your economy is slowing down mm -hmm. and you can't afford to let it grow forever and trash the planet. You need to think about a different economics. So that's the that's a, that's a central call, really, to, for us as economists, as society, as politicians to understand how it might work if it wasn't growing forever. So. But w some would argue, and, and this was actually one of the questions we got through Facebook here, was um, can we not just invest in more and new and more sustainable technologies? Yeah, we can invest in technology. We should invest in technology. Mm. I mean, my starting point really as a scientist was saying, look, you know, we've got destructive technologies on the one hand, like nuclear power and fossil fuels, and we've got lovely clean technologies like solar power and wind power, why don't we just use those technologies, please? Because they'll give us 
the same sort of society. They'll deliver electricity through the pipes. Who cares where the electrons come from? They can do the job for us. But the more I looked at that question, it, it was clear it wasn't just a technological question. Mm -hmm. It was a question of economics. It was mm -hmm. a question of uh, the systems in which you have to fit these technologies. It was a, a question of the perceptions of politicians. And everywhere I looked, I kept coming back to this growth question, the fact that actually we drive our economies harder and harder and faster and faster. And that means we actually have to run faster and faster in terms of our technologies. It's mm. not enough anymore just to have the ability to do renewable technology. We've got to do more and more of that because the economy is growing and growing and growing. And so I began very slowly, somewhat reluctantly, mm -hmm. to come around to the idea, actually, that we should question that fundamental idea of growing forever. Mm -hmm. But you're still arguing in your book that we need more investment. And s in different kind of investment. Different ki can can yeah. you make a more specific? So what's the kind of investment that we need? And what is the kind that we don't need? Yeah, we, we've, had a, we've had a couple of kinds that we don't need, really. I mean, mm. uh, uh, almost all of our pension funds are, are invested in one way or another in extractive industries, digging stuff up out of the ground, putting it into production processes, putting up the chimney and throwing it away at the end of the day. That's the kind of investment that we don't need. And then there's another kind that we don't need, the kind that led to the financial crash. Mm. So instead of the finance sector investing in the real economy, the finance sector was busy financing the finance sector. It was like a gambling casino mm. where everyone bet on the value of commodities and the, and the existence of the future. That's another kind of investment we don't need. Actually, what we need with investment is to reframe the idea of investment as our commitment to the future, which is really what investment mm. kind of means. And that commitment to the future has to be in the technologies like renewable energy and resource efficiency and the circular economy and the protection of ecosystems and habitats and the building of communities, the kinds of investment that lays down the foundations for prosperity tomorrow. So if we do all of these good investments, yeah. does it matter if our economy continues to grow or not? Is that a relevant question for you? It, it's, a very, it's a very central question, particularly mm. in this second edition of the book. I mean, I mean, ultimately, I don't think it does matter if we stay within the limits of the planet, within those resource limits and within the climate change targets and without trashing biodiversity. If something is growing into the future, maybe it's not even the GDP in the conventional way anymore. Of course, that's OK, particularly if it means that we're growing in maturity or we're growing in understanding mm -hmm. or we're growing in empathy or care for each other fantastic the question is can we get that conventional growth that all the economists expect out of this different economy and on the investment side my answer in the book is I'm not absolutely sure as you say we're investing mm. in different things maybe they'll bring a little bit of growth with them on, on the question of what kinds of economic activities that we have though I think it, it does point to definitely a lower growth society and possibly even a degrowth society because I put a lot of emphasis on services rather than material stuff mm -hmm. I put a lot of emphasis on the time that people spend in delivering those services in the quality of those services and that's exactly what's gone missing in our growth-based society we focused on growth assumed it will deliver us a better quality of life and we've forgotten to focus on quality in fact we've been frightened mm -hmm. to focus on quality just mm. in case that hits growth and means that we don't have growth that's the wrong way around we should concentrate on what matters yeah yeah please do join us in this debate and ask your questions send your questions and i will raise them with tim but meanwhile tim you just said um degrowth and um mm. that's a key word of course um and um, there's a growing degrowth movement in Germany, in Europe, possibly throughout the world, although it has different titles yeah. and headings and, and, and formations in different parts of the world. But um, do you feel that your arguments are partly controversial in the degrowth movement? Um, do you feel it because it, it's not the same message that, that the degrowth movement has been giving, right? Or is it? Do you feel mm. there's 
sort of are you are you are you I, part of that I, degrowth I, movement? Or I, are I would you? I would say I would say in a sense I am. I, I, I there's a, a couple of um, French sociologists because the degrowth movement is very big in France. Mm. Décroissance mm. sounds much better in French, um, and and the French sociologists talk about. <laughs> The, the impact of prosperity without growth on the degrowth movement mm -hmm. in France. And, and it, they talk about it in a very interesting way because they sort of say there was this split between those people who were talking about sustainable development and how conventional that was, and then degrowth, which is this radical opposition to the entire model, and how that split had begun to divide the debate. And then when prosperity without growth came along, nobody could figure out which side of the divide Mm. it actually sat on and to some extent it, it did the job of pulling those sides mm -hmm. back together again that actually within the degrowth bait debate it was possible then to think again about economics and the economic models that you could build that would make things better mm -hmm. and on the sustainable development side you could once again legitimately begin to question growth and that that's a fundamental Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that's a really important thing to be able to do. Am I a degrowth person? Actually, the degrowth community is very, very broad, and, and I think mm. somewhere in the middle I would fit. Mm. Mm. Okay. We've got a question from our listeners here on Facebook, somebody who wants to know whether you think that um, growth is part of our economic DNA. Yeah, it's definitely part of the economic DNA. It has been for, you know, 70, 80 years. It has been since the... The, the Great Depression and the concerns about a declining uh, economy. And it sits, I mean, it sits in the, you know, the very first lines of economic textbooks that our needs as human beings, mm. needs and wants are insatiable. And so, you know, we're forever will be wanting to grow to get a better quality of life. And it sits in the DNA of the way that we, we think about companies and profit maximization in companies, the way that we think about the fiduciary duties of companies to increase the value of shares for their shareholders mm. that idea that the whole thing is about getting bigger and bigger is written in certain ways in, into the dna of of, of the economy mm -hmm. and, and, and of companies yeah <laughs> there's a question <laughs> coming yeah. which is exactly the one i wanted to ask now so what what's your plan to get from a to b so from where we are now how do we get out of that what's your vision is that more of a that's my part of the question adding to that now is yeah. it more of a reformist approach of small steps, or is that more okay. revolutionary, yeah. transformational? I mean, I mean, there's different ways of asking that question. So are you saying, am I for revolution or transformational reform? Um, I, I, I suppose, you know, between reform, which is you sit there and you tinker at the edges of legislation, and revolution, where you just tear everything down and throw everything away, there's something which I like to think of as transformation, mm -hmm. which says you don't ever stop asking the most fundamental questions and you don't ever stop questioning your own assumptions about those things so it's really it is radical but it isn't about just tearing down for the sake of tearing down it's about change and and providing the architecture of change yeah. and then at the second level of answering that question you know what's the what's the plan what's the architecture of change i think you take those bits of the system which have broken you take enterprise and mm -hmm. profit maximization and you shift it you will t you change that vision round so that enterprise becomes about purpose and about service you take work which has become a sort of form of wage slavery which diminishes people's quality of life and you say no work is about our ability to participate in society and you build the institutions the structures that allow people to work in a better way investment same thing money system same thing and all of those fundamental building blocks you start to change from the inside out and transform the system mm. and do you feel like we've already ha we, we already have a plan of what the future economy will look like do we mm -hmm. need do you think we need such a mas master plan a, a very concrete vision of what it will look like i think there's a um, there's beginning to be a, a sort of a vision. So it was really interesting during the, the recent election in the UK actually to see a lot of language around the idea of let's have an economy that works. Mm. And it was uh, an economy that works for everyone. So it was a call for a vision 
of a different kind of society, an inclusive society that looks after the poorest, in which we judge how good we are as a society by looking at those who are least well off. Mm -hmm. We don't govern for the rich and the minority mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the, the financial elite. We govern for, for ordinary people. And that's the beginnings of a different kind of vision. It's the beginnings of a different way of saying, actually, this is what economics is for. It's not for chasing after growth. It's, it's for looking after people. Mm. That doesn't mean to say, of course, there's, there's n no room for variation. And it doesn't mean to say that every answer is already given. On the contrary, I think you know, there's, we're working at the answers. We can't see it all clearly. And that makes it frightening. But it also makes it kind of exciting because there's a lot there to play for mm. within that vision. Mm -hmm. You started this work advising the UK government, right? So um, in between then and now, the Brexit decision <laughs> happened. And, and how does this debate fit into current debates in the UK around I think, Brexit I think it, and what's coming? Yeah, next? I mean, the Brexit debate, <laughs> I mean, we could do the, the, mm. the no growth bit of it probably quite <laughs> easily. Um, you know, if you trash your market and you piss off your trading partners and you remove yourself from a... Uh, you know, a, a political movement that has brought nations together over mm. over a certain number of years, then, you know, you can probably trash your economy quite well, but that's not the prosperity bit of it. Mm -hmm. I think I think what what the Brexit debate tells us though, and it gives us an understanding of um, is is the failings of that existing model, the failings of some of its institutions, the failings of money systems, the, the, the poverty, the real poverty and insecurity that came out of a broken system. And, and the first reaction to that was a very a left wing politics of people saying, actually, enough is enough. Give me a different system. And then people got even more scared and mm. they began to be scared about, you know, the wrong things, in a sense, the people they felt were taking their mm. jobs from all over the rest of Europe or the openness of borders that they felt as though they'd never agreed to or all the regulations coming down the line from Europe um, because they were stopping us getting on with our job of growing the economy. And, and I think, you know, I think this, this, is, this is what Brexit and the politics of today really tells us. It tells us how badly broken that system is. Mm. Can we pull that out of the ashes? Can we rebuild those relationships? We have to kind of hope that we can, but it's definitely become a more difficult task. Mm. Mm. There's a question coming in about jobs. Are there any jobs without growth? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, if, if you ask a conventional politician, they'd say no. Mm. Um, they say, you know, almost in the same breath, they say jobs and growth, jobs and growth, jobs mm. and growth. If you don't have growth, you can't have jobs. It's, mm. like, a, it's like a mantra in the political mind that, that growth equals jobs. But actually, it's, and it's one of the questions that I, I look at really closely in the book, it just isn't true. Uh, it all depends on what kind of growth you can, it turns out you can have growth without any jobs at all, mm -hmm. and what kind of jobs. And it turns out you can have a lot of jobs without a great deal of growth. In fact, mm. ironically, that's one of the things that we've shown since the crisis is that our employment level in the UK is higher than it's ever been since records began, mm. even though we had a declining economy. So, yes, you can have jobs without growth. Mm. You have to think about what those jobs are. Mm. They're not necessarily the conventional manufacturing um, where you, where, which is all about the linear throughput of materials from the ground to production processes to shops to people's lives to the rubbish dump. Mm. There are more jobs around services, around care, around craft, around building things that last, around creativity and artistic expression, around culture. And that's the really, the really amazing thing to me. If you think about the economy in that way, it has much more... Um, employment in it. it it's, a, it's a more job-rich economy, even mm. though it doesn't grow so fast. Mm. But for some, I, I agree, and that's a very positive vision, but there is a big worry about jobs being lost, not because we have less growth, but because we have new technologies coming yeah, in. Yeah, so yeah. new um, so digital technologies um, yeah. Algorithms taking over jobs, um, mm. robots, artificial intelligence, mm. all of that. Um, 
and that impacts some of the sectors you just mentioned, including the care sector. Mm. So how do you factor that in, uh, or how do you yeah, that? Yeah, the robots are coming, and they will either save us or ruin us, depending on mm. who you believe. And um, I, I think we're, we're standing, I mean, we're standing in a debate that has been had before, you know, the idea that technology will take all the jobs away mm -hmm. uh, was a fear mm. um, in the Industrial Revolution. It was a fear again in the 1960s, 70s. Um, it's, it's a fear now and it's a very mm -hmm. legitimate fear now. There are some things where you would want those jobs to be taken away because they're not very pleasant, they're not very nice, um, they're not even safe sometimes. Mm. And so the idea that we use technology to improve the quality of our working lives I think is, is a really strong one. But there are also places where it doesn't really substitute for human interaction, for mm. the time that we can give as people to the service of, of other people. And, and of course, yes, use technology in the care sector to make that job easier. But does that mean taking away our doctors and our nurses and our carers and our social workers? I don't think it does. Mm. And I think we have to be very wary of any vision of the economy and any vision of work which suggests that there there won't be time for people in the service of other people. There will mm. always be that need. Mm. Mm. So we've so far mostly kept in sort of the European space with this discussion, but yeah. this, this has become a global debate, right? And this is being picked up and, and, and there's interest from, from, from people, governments, scientists, academics in, um, in countries in the global south as well. So one, of, one of the reactions we often get at the Heinrich Böll Foundation when we talk to people in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa about, about the need for a post-growth society, the answer we get is, but that's for you, you know, rich countries, maybe, but definitely not for a country mm. like Nigeria. You know? mm. This is mm. all about growth. We need to grow. Mm. Do, we need growth yeah. in order to develop, etc. So, know, so how do you look at that question? I'm, I'm really sensitive to that to that point and actually it's it, it's the starting point for for prosperity without growth it's the starting point for the book is that there are countries where 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 absolute poverty is is really unforgivable in the in the 21st mm -hmm. century and and it's also clear when you look at the the evidence that those are the places where growth brings a better quality of life undeniable better quality of life. Infant mortality plummets as you bring countries out of poverty. Mm. Life expectancy rises from 50 years to 80 years as your income goes from nothing to $10,000, $15,000 per capita. That's the place where growth really makes a difference. So it's very understandable, it's very defensible for poor countries to say actually we need to improve those material conditions but there is nonetheless, and this to me was really surprising, interest from those poorer countries in this kind of work. There's mm. a recognition that actually we don't find those things at any cost. We don't, we don't grow at any cost. We actually grow in order to improve the quality of life of our citizens and mm. not, as one minister from Ecuador told me at a UN meeting, mm. not so that we can become a consumerist society. Mm. He said to me very explicitly, he said to the meeting very explicitly, um, you know, if that's what it means to grow, then we don't want to grow. Mm. And they put, in, they put this concept of buen vivir in, mm -hmm. in place in Ecuador as the heart of their constitution. Buen vivir, Volstand, living well, mm. is exactly the heart of the idea that there's a different way to do things. And that's even in one of the poorest economies in the world. Yeah, the good life for all. So um, just a final question before we have to close um, this chat for now is, um, so you're presenting this book tonight um, at 6 p.m. at the Heinrich Böll Foundation to um, a mostly German audience. Mm. So is there anything specific that you think Germans we in <laughs> Germany should be thinking yeah. about? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, just you pick kind one. of now, you know. I, I, yeah, just <laughs> pick one. Um, so, and I'm not going to make it your export industry. That's um, that's mm -hmm. not going to because I know how politically <laughs> sensitive that all is. Um, I, I, you know, I think I think this, in a sense, the, the the debate about degrowth in in Germany has been has been fantastic. You know, it gets more press interest, more reception, more intellectual interest here than it 
did in the UK, which is where the mm. report originates. So that's really, it's kind of strange, but it's also really exciting, particularly as I think, you know, one of the roles that Germany has played, along with France perhaps, is this leadership role in Europe, in a Europe that still can make a difference to the way we think about prosperity. It's also, of course, been a Europe um, which has created some of the institutions that have stood in the way of that prosperity. But to have a stronger vision of prosperity, a stronger vision of Wohlstand at the heart of Germany, at the heart of a European politics, that would be fantastic. Mm, great. So um, if you want to hear more and see more of, of, of Tim tonight at 6 p.m., he's presenting his book, Wohlstand ohne Wachstum, Prosperity Without Growth, the second edition, the update. Um, tonight at 6 p.m. And if you're not in Berlin and can't come to see us here, there's also a live stream available on the Heinrich Böll Foundation website. So you cannot follow us on um, Facebook, but on the Böll Foundation website. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so Thanks, much, Lily. Tim. Thanks.